problems of the who can solve all the problems of the world? Who can find the cure? Heal the sick? Help the poor? Who can bring peace to the world? Bring light to the dark? Who can take us to unknown planets? Who can make us value nature? Or teach machines what emotions are? We all can. Together. It depends on us. Because we believe that in the end, our human potential is unlimited. Moi, everybody, and greetings from Tampere. In this new situation, almost the first new idea we got was to talk to you, our dear alumni. We came to the idea of organizing a worldwide webinar to reach you all at the same time. Thank you for joining us. I would like to say a few words about the new normal in education. You know that I love challenging the educational world. The education has been very subject and teacher centered for hundreds of years. But now, this new time, the new normal, as we want to call it here, has pretty not much overnight challenged everything of our every day. And it was everybody at the very same time. Albert Einstein said once that today's problems cannot be solved the way we created them. We very much need new thinking now. We must act changing the subject-based organized schools to more complicated phenomena-oriented platforms, right? First of all, revolutional thinkers are wanted and needed. What we need for future school is a stunning vision, yes, a dream school, built in cooperation with our students, yes, you heard right, students, using and enhancing creative thinking. We have to facilitate instead of ordering. We have to trust our people. They will find the dream. What if the schools of new normal are called learning societies? Schools are there where people are and they are open for everybody, for example. They operate both as local innovator hubs and global arenas of learning and innovations. Learning will happen when curious try and error processes are allowed and students and teachers are empowered. The only wrong and right world is gone. Knowledge is not anymore the only power. Power of today and tomorrow is white thinking capacity and multiliteracy skills. Power is also our networks. This is why we are here today. With these few thoughts, I want to challenge you to discuss in your schools with leaders, with colleagues, and especially students, the new normal of educational world. Be creative and curious. There are more questions than answers, but new ideas in education are all worth testing. Miss you all, guys. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, evening, or afternoon, depending on the region and country that you're located in. I'm saying this because we have participants from all around the world. We have people from China participating and people from Latin America and from everywhere in between. We are very proud to present the first ever TAMC Global Alumni Seminar. And as all of you probably know, this is my colleague Virpi. Thank you. And here you have my colleague Ped Peters. So, because of the current pandemic situation, obviously we cannot be traveling to visit you guys, and you guys cannot travel to visit us. So instead we decided to test out something new for us, and that is why we set up this webinar. Our crew are taking 
school for today is consisting of our media and art students from our Mediapolis campus. And the director behind all of this is our colleague from Brazil, Renata Brito. Abir, would you say a few words about the format of the seminar? Of course I would. Uh, first of all, lovely to have you here. Uh, we heard we have around 400 people participating today. So this seminar will be lasting approximately two hours. We have created uh, a Padlet and you in the Padlet will find three different sections. The section number one is for your questions to our people. Our people who participate uh, either live here from uh, Mediapolis uh, campus or our guests joining us online from all over the globe via online. Number two box, please. There you can write feedback. You can share articles, maybe something of interest you found or something that you would like to share with all of us. That could be a useful resource for all of us. Or you can just comment how the seminar is going. Then there is a third box. This is an important box. Here, we would like to hear from you during this whole time. What would you like to learn in the future? We have created uh, this format of seminars. And if you like what you see today, our intention is to continue in the fall after the summer break. So please give ideas what we could talk about in our next seminar. You will have a link soon in your uh, chat box. And please log into the Padlet and be active part of this web webinar. This is what we like. Today, we are unable to give the floor to all of you. There are also polls in the Zoom that you are now right now logged in. And they are, there are small questions about Finland. Because we have a tight schedule, uh, we will always choose only one question to all of our presenters. And those questions come from that board that you will see in the Padlet. Be active, since we will be sharing some uh, nice gifts uh, from Finland for five most active participants. So please, uh, be active. After the first hour of the seminar, we will have a, a small break for you to have uh, a quick cup of coffee or uh, a cup of water. Thank you, Virpi. So now let's hand out the floor to our first speaker, live here at Mediapolis, the world known Tina Koskira. Hello, everybody, and it's a big, big pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to you today. During last 30 years, the world has changed enormously, and like Karita was talking about, now we are going through this new normal, and uh, this corona has changed everything even more. Have you ever questioned, uh, why do we still educate people the same way as we have educated them at least for 100 years? If we look at the future of job report from World Economic Forum, it's telling that the three top skills in 2020 will be complex problem solving, critical thinking and creativity. In the same report, they are saying new currency is going to be skills. We need for on the job, more on the job experiences and learning with each other. Martin Neumeyer is talking about new talents for the robotic age, and he says that we need uh, feeling, capability of feeling, seeing, dreaming, making, and learning. And actually, he says learning is the most important one. So how do we really answer these demands? We have all that cold in our hands, like all the students, all the material uh, that we can really help 
to be able to change this whole world. So what are we really going to do with them? What kind of tools do we give them to do, uh, to do big things in the world? I'm working in Y Campus, which is a place uh, where we concentrate on entrepreneurship and innovation, and we're working with students. And we're using mostly their challenge-based learning. And what do we really mean by that? It's, it's about real-life challenges. So our students get real-life challenges from companies, from third sector, from cities, from universities. And they do a limited time work together to give a solution to that challenge. It can be something like user experience in a new tram, or sharing economy in food retail, or how do we really reduce food waste, or how do we increase attraction of small cities, uh, so, or innovate better sustainable cities. So really different kind of challenges, uh, really different kind of teams, really different kind of ways how we do it. But they always follow design process. So we have a specific design process that we are using for this kind of an innovation. And we keep it as simple as possible to, for the students, uh, easy to follow. There is always time limit. That's because we need pressure. We need to uh, feel the pressure of the challenge so that we really, really put all the effort for that. It's also effective learning. We use always multidisciplinary teams. So they, students are coming from different fields and they combine that, those skills that they have uh, together to make something even bigger. We have, uh, for example, three courses, Innovation Challenges, which is like a couple of weeks to eight weeks course. And there they solve these kind of challenges. We have Sprint Innovation Festival, which is actually for 600 to 700 students at the same time working one week together to solve different kind of challenges. In there, we have like 10 to 20 different kind of organizations, uh, companies from the third sector, and we have like 30 coaches who are helping the students. And also, we have like student project group, so students are arranging the whole event. Why do we think that challenge-based learning is actually the thing? Uh, to give to the students really possibility to rehearse skills as we, what we were talking about uh, at the beginning. So they really need to do things. Also, we think that the world is so complex that nobody can uh, solve these kind of uh, challenges alone. So only team can find solutions wise enough. We also want our students to be able to understand the difference between group and team, because there is a difference. And when you have a challenge which is really difficult enough so that you understand, I can't do this alone, then the teamwork starts. And you can, uh, you can really make something bigger than just uh, people doing things individually or sharing like in groups we usually do. Uh, also, we want our students to start loving learning, because that's the key thing, like Martin Omeyer said. We need people who really love learning, and they want to do it their whole life. And also, they want to uh, solve problems, so they love problem solving. How do you do this? Uh, as a teachers, we need to think uh, things again. So, new way of learning need new way of teaching. And you have to give up to be able to create something new. We are using actually the idea of a really, really classical business book, The Leadership Challenge, uh, made by coaches and Bosner. Um, we're using five principles for leadership as an idea for us. How do we really coach our students? Because we don't want to say we teach them, we coach them. We model the way. Uh, it means that we have this kind of a process that helps the students to do this innovation. And it has to be as clear as possible. We inspire a sh shared vision. This is not only about challenges, doing one challenge, one course. This is about changing the whole mindset, understanding what is going to be, what kind of a world we will, we will have in the future. What can we really do to make things 
different. And we explain this again and again and again and repeat. We challenge the whole teaching process. So we give to the students a lot of freedom, a lot of autonomy, but also we ex expect a lot from them. Uh, enabling others to act. So we really enable students to act the way that we make sure they have a really best conditions ever when they are working. If they have problems, it's our job to solve them. And also encourage the heart. So we give feedback, feedback, feedback. We are there, we are present, we are available, but we are responsible for the process. Students are responsible for the solutions. And we believe to the students, we believe them more than they ever believe in themselves. And that's, that's the magic, that's the power for, for uh, really, really exceptional solutions. Thank you for listening and hopefully you have good questions for me. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Dina, for your excellent speech. Hi, everyone. I'm Stella. I work as China expert at Damg Edu. Here we have a question for Dina from Padlet. What is the most needed skill for 21st century educators, in your opinion? Do I have to choose one? <laughs> uh, I think all of our students actually need to know something about leadership. Because 21st century uh, Students that were graduates or who, who work, they need, uh, they have to lead themselves, but they also have to lead uh, the other ones. And I think the idea of understanding like diversity, why do we need to do work with different kind of people, even though it's much harder than to work with the people who talk the same way as me, like engineers together or, or people from media together or people from nursing together. So that's... That's uh, one point of, of leadership, like the modern leadership, diversity, and also the um, understanding of that you have to do things together all the time, listen to different kind of people, uh, see what's around the corner, this kind of skills you need. So I think leadership is actually, it, 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 it's really, really important. Okay. Um I totally agree about the leadership skills. And actually, could you tell something about pedagogical leadership? Because I know that at Dunk we do pedagogical leadership training to teachers of different countries. I've been working with tens, hundreds of teachers, uh, giving them idea of what team coaching actually means. Uh, how does it differ from, from te normal teaching? And what I was telling there, I think it's a different way of seeing teaching. It's one model of teaching, but it's a different kind of a way to see what's my, what is my role. And I think actually teaching is more about learning. Like how do I really make possible for these guys here to learn and be passionate about the learning? Thank you. I totally agree. The word passionate is the key here. Next is our speaker joining online from Portugal. Vera, welcome. Hello, everyone. And please receive my uh, best regards from Portugal. I was invited today to share with you a bit what we learned from our friends at Tank and at Provitenio. And the first thing we learned from you was a bit about the way we position ourselves and the way we organize our classrooms. This is our usual classroom, a bit traditional with students organized in uh, lines and the teacher being in the center of the classroom. And actually after we go there, we are trying to deorganize our classrooms and make the student the center of the learning process. And that is a bit the summary of what we have learned to transform our uh, teaching approach to a more learning based approach with hands on experience where we allow students to learn by doing 
and also have a lot of project-based and multidisciplinary approaches. And it was a challenge for us. It was not easy peasy uh, learning uh, because we are Latins, we speak a lot, we voice out our opinions and we were always being challenged to actively doing nothing. And that was a challenge because in the first few uh, experiences, we had this feeling that we were exactly doing nothing. But actually, it's really hard work to uh, follow students' work and decide not to interfere at moments where they have some conflict and some real challenges and allow them to discover by themselves and learn by themselves how they can take the most out of that situation. So we learned that the learning process is less about us and more about them, the students, and that is what we should do to focus on the students and let them lead their learning processes. So I should start by thanking Pro Academia partners and Temp for allowing us to learn from you. After learning, we came back home and we decided to do a few things and that's what the update i will give you now the first thing we created was a group a working group for uh, formative innovation for the whole um, polytechnic institute of Magenza. and in this group we included a lot of people that were uh, receiving teacher training in pro academia so they know what we are talking about and for sure they are aligned with our strategy and we started doing small things at first we started by motivating our teachers to include more practical experiences inside the course plans for bachelor students short cycle students and master students we call it the plus company project and each teacher identified a real life pro problem from a stakeholder and brought it to the classroom and took the students to real life context to apply their skills and develop their skills. But not, it was not always possible to use this plus company approach. So uh, sometimes we needed to create opportunity for students to do things outside their course plans. And that uh, uh, way allow them to have the same proximity to the real world, to companies and to public entities where they will work in a few years. And that was why we created this uh, flexibility program and personalization program for students that we call 10% up to you, where students are allowed to replace 10% of their credits for alternative learning approaches that they can uh, use uh, for alternative learning methods, non-technical or technical uh, subjects from other degrees. But that was not enough for us. And we had the entrepreneurship approach of Pro Academia on, your, on our minds. So we applied to our national agency and now we have been running two new masters. One that is focused on entrepreneurship and innovation as a whole. And the other one is more tech-based and it's called Product and Process Innovation and combines engineering and technology to entrepreneurship. Both masters try to adapt pro academia methodology to our uh, cultural context and to our reality. So students are challenged either to create their own businesses in any business area in the entrepreneurship and innovation master, and we use the same approach as we saw in Pro Academia with the coaching and facilitation and peer-to-peer -peer learning activities, uh, together with also some technical consultants that come from finances and business world. And then we have the product and process innovation where we, uh, together in the entrepreneurship, we also have students that are um, innovating inside the companies where they are working. And we also want to implement in a short future a problem solving for real companies of our region. In this second master, we have a higher involvement of our research centers and our researchers that can act either as technical consultants 
or as a bridge for students to develop further their prototypes of their new product and process um, uh, to implement the, in their business. And how far have we been? We started uh, one and a half year ago, so not long. And uh, it was, we had some challenges and some of you were asking me yesterday about the challenges. And the most challenges came from more traditional colleagues inside the departments and also from some students that uh, also need to be challenged on their more passive uh, approach to the learning process. And for some students, it is also a challenge to be included in such an active but I must say that we are lucky ones and we could do it and we found the correct people to be involved in. And most of our students are really excited to be part of such a program where they can, in fact, implement their good ideas and test them and, and uh, develop them further. So on one and a half years, what are the results that I can share with you? Uh, from now, I have students from eight different countries involved in the two programs together. They are they have activities combined, so I am counting students from both programs. And I also uh, am very happy to say that we already have seven companies created by the students of these masters. Two of those companies were already running when the students arrived at the master. And the other students who are willing to start their company, they have our support to uh, uh, raise funding for their company. And uh, until this moment, they raised over 50,000 euros that are allowing them to start their prototype and their lab testing. So we are quite happy with these results. And this is a bit the scheme that uh, represents our approach that it's a really interactive and dynamic approach and combines a lot of the methodologies that we learned from TEMP together with our strength as uh, an institution of research and of course our um, professors acting at either as consultants and mentors. So again, thank you to TEMP and thank you for challenging us and to allow us to learn from you and come back and do it on our own way. Hello, Vera. It was so good to finally hear and see you. Uh, I have some questions for you. Uh, could you hum, uh, describe us, did you need to sell this new approach? to your students? And if you did, how did you do it? Yeah, actually, we did need to do some marketing of our project, yes. And when we came back from our last visit to Providenia, we, we were still in the airport designing our marketing strategy. It was um, a challenge, we decided to organize the free workshop for students that were uh, interested in applying for a free workshop on entrepreneurship and innovation. And from there, we identified some students that were willing to be our first team. And we started with a small uh, 12 students team on the first year. But then they were our marketeers. And they were the ones that were putting the word out there about what we do on our master. And they were challenging their friends and colleagues to uh, apply to the masters that we were creating. But still, we need, we have a bit more challenge to find the right, the right students for with a more engineer and technical background for the innovation and product and process master. And that is more of a challenge because they have less um, profile uh, developed in terms of entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you, Vera, very much for, for the answer. Uh, our participants from Zoom, I would like to remember, please log into our Padlet and be active. Give us feedback and give us questions. Our next lecturer uh, will be our beloved 
Hanna Saraketa. The floor is yours. Thank you, Virpi. Yes, my name is Hanna, and I think I have met most of you over there who are joining this webinar today. Uh, I have worked for TAM 20 years now and seven years as a team coach, so I don't know, do any teaching anymore, but team coaching, yes. So, when I was young, and that was some 35 years ago, group work was the greatest pedagogical innovation in the schools of Finland. Group work here and group work there. I felt that we did lots of group work during my school years, and sometimes I did learn at least about group work and all the disadvantages of it. Interesting enough, this spring, 35 years later, I googled the word group work, and this is what I got. Exactly the same kind of stuff I experienced when I was young. Someone does 99% of the work. Someone has no idea what is going on the whole time. Someone says he's going to help, but he is not. Someone disappears in the very beginning and does not show up again till the very end. What? Some improvement should have happened in 35 years. Whereas now, at Tampere University of Applied Sciences, I belong to several working teams myself, and I work as a team coach for a couple of student teams. According to this definition, team is a group of people with different skills and different tasks who work together on a common project service or goal with a meshing of functions and mutual support. I like teams. We know that alone you have small potential, potential but teamwork gives you big potential. At TAMP Pro Academia, the name of the bachelor degree program is Entrepreneurship and Team Leadership. We really believe in teams. Not just working in teams, but also learning in teams. Team learning. Team gives you support, safety, connections, direction, and team feeling. It feels good, even great, to be part of the team, doesn't it? Imagine that happening at schools. Uh, it was 1965 when Bruce Tuckman introduced this team and group development model. It shows team effectiveness and their progress through four stages. First, there is forming, then, unfortunately, uh, but quite necessarily, storming, then norming, and finally, performing. A highly performing team, everybody's dream. There is no team without trust, says Paul Santancha, head of industry at Google. And he is so right. Team is based on trust. And I just have to mention Patrick Lencioni here. This pyramid is his famous and well-known model, the five dysfunctions of a team, and it is based on trust. No trust, no function in team. Trust creation process is a very slow process. We always tell you a thousand times uh, to trust the process. Here we are again, encouraging you to trust the process and to take baby steps. So, to be able to better trust the process of team formation, let's pay attention to the trust creation process. This is how I see it happens. You have a team. Team has a common goal, as mentioned earlier, and a shared vision. The team needs to work to do something together and to be together, communicate, live, to get experiences together. Every now and then, they need to stop and reflect Give and receive feedback. Think, think, think together. How is this team? Why does it exist? What have we done? How? How do we behave? All this takes time. But trust creation takes time. You cannot just say, let's trust each other and ta-da! Trust is there. Time and actions are needed. Trust needs to be earned and given. Easy to say in theory, but how does this go in practice? How do you know 
if you are starting to form a team that is based on trust. I have collected these, collected these baby steps by observing you in our trainings and the students in my proactive teams. I decided to present them in a bingo form. You know, this corona time created several online meeting bingos in social media, at least in my social media. Maybe you have played one of these. This is a Zoom bingo. There are some quite commonly used sentences like, I think you are mute. Can you hear me now? Sorry, you go first, etc. Well, my bingo includes the very first signs of trust. Trust bingo. There are small things you can pay attention to or ask your students or team members to pay attention to. Mark as checked and thus better trust the process. You can say to yourself, according to Hannah's experience, we are on the right path. We are in the process of, process of creating a team. So what do we have here? People know each other's names. This seems to be an easy one in cultures where people are used to learn each other's names immediately, but that is not the case in Finland. Team shares a word of their own. In Chile, Universidad Diego Portales, they invented the word co-coach rather quickly. That is not a normal word in my dictionary, but the point is that the team and only the team understands its meaning the way it is meant to be understood. Team has some vocabulary of their own. This happens surprisingly quickly, luckily. People adapt and uh, use kind of the same language. Somebody has shared something personal, like I have two children, I love Chinese food. Somebody dares to say, I didn't understand, what did, we, that, what did we just decide, or something like that. And that's it. Bingo, you are on the right path. More. Someone suggests, let's have a beer afterwards. Or people show interest in learning about behavior. I think this is fasc fascinating, especially when young people say, I want to learn more about human behavior, teamwork, etc. Or uh, people give credits or thanks when encouraged, not just for politeness, but because they really want to thank someone. There are moments of true dialogue, active listening, genuine voicing, respecting, and suspending oneself from making conclusions, judgments, or opinions too quickly. Bingo! More advanced ones. Someone offers to help another one. Someone has opened up, you know, can't keep it anymore. True, open, and honest burst. Let it all out. Somebody is able to joke about himself, or it is allowed to warmly joke about someone. Bingo! The atmosphere is full of trust at this point. Or if we just add this. Team has discussed about their goals. People agree on exceptions uh, beforehand, for example, uh, absence or coming in late or this kind of things. Or a lonely wolf starts to delegate tasks. Bingo again. The lonely wolf starts to trust that the others are quite capable to. Feel free to discover and invent more. Contrary to my childhood's group work sessions, let's keep on investing in the teamwork and to the team formation process and to the trust creation process too. Individuals cannot just be thrown together and to be expected to get along. It is said that organizations must set aside sufficient time and resources to nurture positive, trusting work relationships within their teams. It is the same at schools and educational institutions. There are lots of things you can do to build trust. Please, play bingo at least. Hey, thank you for creating this bingo tool with me. Thank you, Hannah. 
So I actually studied in Prague at the I graduated about four years ago. And Hanna was one of the coaches that influenced me and my studies a lot. So I want to thank Hanna. And uh, we have a question for you. So if there's a group of people that has been in conflict before, can you kind of refine uh, trust? Can you find the trust if there's already been conflict? What do you say? This is an excellent question. Thank you for that. And as a team coach, as I mostly do, I would like to throw it back to Pepe at least. Pepe at least, like, what would you say yourself? Because I know you, you, you have been in these situations also. But if you imagine yourself in this in kind of situation, for example, in your personal life, if the trust is gone, then it takes a lot of effort to get it back. But it is, it is worth it. So, but lots of actions will be needed, unfortunately. But it's worth it. Okay. And I actually remember the storming part from my Pro Academy at times very well. And I think that's the kind of phase where we learn the most. Uh, because of our tight schedule, we cannot ask the other questions now. But I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Buenos dias, Andres. Hi. Um... Uh, my name is uh, Andres Saller. I'm the head of uh, the Economics and Business School uh, of Diego Portales University in Chile. And I wanted to briefly talk with you about our experience uh, with coaching with uh, Campro Academia in particular and uh, how meaningful it is for our future projects and what we have learned so far and what we can share with you. Um, we are in the, in the middle of uh, reforming our university of a new curriculum uh, where we want to move from uh, uh, teaching in a, in a more traditional sense towards uh, teaching more uh, competences-based uh, learning, and in particular, changing the way we teach entrepreneurship uh, and, and creating a new specialization um, based on on team learning and coaching, and that's where uh, the work we are doing with TAMC is, is so important to us. But in order to understand, the, the, um, I would say, the challenge we have, um, I wanted to like briefly mention about something about the Chilean context. We in Chile have a very traditional, uh, I would say, university education way of teaching and learning. Um, it's a very uh, usually like chalk and board type of uh, education and a very vertical or hierarchical relationship between students and teachers. And culturally, our country, uh, being in Latin America and with a Latin, a Latin culture, uh, is heavily based the trust setting uh, uh, in the family. But when you go out of family and you go into a student setting or work setting, the amount, I would say, of uh, collaboration, sharing, and team building is very low. And usually there is a culture of I would say distrust and competition, and sometimes extreme uh, case of distrust and competition, and it's a big challenge in your country. So in that sense, being able to move from that type of setting towards a, uh, a more trust-based way of learning is a big challenge to us, and that's why we have been uh, partnering with uh, already for a year, in the case of us, with, um, with TAMC and Pro Academia. Uh, and uh, so far, what we have done uh, since last year is we, uh, did it, have done in Chile, and I want to share a couple of, uh, of uh, testimonies uh, to how meaningful this has been for us. We have done already a, a adaptation of the INNO event that uh, the Finnish do uh, once a year um, in, in Chile, where we had 120 students and teachers from different parts of our university. And we uh, sent Chilean students to Pro Academia to participate and uh, experience the, the team way of learning in terms of uh, coaching uh, and to be, to be able to see if we could adapt uh, this model to us. And um, so far it has been a huge success and a huge experience for everybody. And um, I just want to share a couple of, of thoughts and uh, experiences we've had. Uh, in, the, uh, in the business camp uh, with, that we called, which is a uh, similar inno event that, they, uh, that has been done in Finland, uh, we uh, uh, like a personal experience from my case uh, as a teacher uh, is that uh, I would say only a couple of times in my life I felt that uh, I, I am working with others towards a real common goal where we're all uh, pushing for the same uh, objective and where the level of collaboration and trust uh, 
you make, makes you feel that everybody is there for you and you you're there for everybody and to be sincere they, they, probably one or two times i felt like that in a, in a team setting and, the, and it was several years ago in my university time and the, in my working life probably this has been the first time that i felt that way when we were organizing with teachers this in no event um and it's that that relevant uh, uh, how it has been for us and from a student perspective uh, one uh, declaration of one student that participated in this event where they had to experience uh, uh, coaching in teams is that uh, this guy said that um, I, in, my, in my four years of education, I, I have, I'm used to being sitting in a, in a, in a seat learning, learning theory. Uh, this has been the first time that I've experienced a, a meaningful way of understanding this four years of education. And this is just by doing this teamwork that I'm mentioning. Uh, and that's how it, it, will, it has mattered so far, and it, it will matter to us. And right now, we are in the process um, for the next years to, to consolidate this partnership. And we are in the process of us, as teachers, of certificating and learning more deeper uh, the coach setting. And uh, so it's going to be a part of, uh, uh, of a central part of, 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 the, of the learning process we will do so far. Uh, I want to stop there because I have only five minutes uh, to, uh, to answer questions, but uh, thank you very much for listening. Andres, uh, always yes. a pleasure to see and hear you. Uh, it has been actually wonderful cooperating with your university and uh, such an enthusiastic uh, group of coaches you are forming right now in Universidad Diego Portales. Uh, we have yeah. actually just heard that we have actually 449 people uh, connected with us in Zoom. That's great. I would also like to apologize because I heard some of you had some problems on, uh, on logging. So hopefully now we have all of you on board. Um, I have a, one question for you, Andres. Sure. Um, what do you think has been the hardest thing uh, arranging an, such a big event like Inno event uh, in, in your university uh, in Chile? Um, again, I would say the, the hardest thing um, has been in our setting to break the, uh, the, the individual logic of working and um, and creating a, a team setting uh, where trust uh, is the um, is the is the key issue to start with. Um, I wouldn't say maybe it's it was the hardest, but it was the thing we feared the most when we started. Uh, but but uh, throughout the different things we we have been learning so far on how to set up a, a, a trust, I would say, environment. It was at the end easier than we expected. But my per my personal fear at the beginning was that was that w was going to be the hardest thing to establish, both at the student level and at and a particular the teacher level, where you we are older, we are more uh, we are less eager sometimes to learn, and we have our own beliefs uh, and ways of doing things. So uh, I would say that was that was my my, my biggest challenge uh, or our biggest challenge so far to to make something like this work. But at the end, uh, it ended up working like much better than, well, than uh, me and we expected. So uh, that's why also we're eager to push for this forward uh, much, much more in depth. Very good to hear that. And I'm so glad we keep to continue uh, working with you, uh, just starting uh, prepping you up uh, online uh, in these coaching uh, methods. I thought you would yep. say the hardest thing, I don't know if you remember the challenges we had while yep. we were uh, initiating the actual INNO event. We had to go, instead of organizing this in your own university, we had to go to a rented place. That must have ah, been a, a <laughs> huge work behind. How, how did it go, Andres? Well, uh, uh, well that, it's a good point. I, I actually forgot about that. Uh, we were, uh, uh, while we were doing this INNO event, we had a, a social explosion in our country, uh, um, and uh, we had to move the actual closing of the event to outside of the university. Um, 
it well in that sense uh, it it was a big challenge but the actually we had a, a, the um, the team actually was extremely important the team of coaches and the, the team like surrounding us in terms of the management of the event which helped us immediately to call uh, different venues hotels etc to find a place to be able to do this and uh, i would say again the well we, we were already working and feeling that this was happening with the contribution of all of us uh, it was a pretty big challenge but since I, I i the fact that i didn't remember it also shows that i was feeling in particular that i that this was going to work anyway and uh, and it ended up working pretty well feeling that that the, everybody was putting their own part to do this the best possible way so uh, once you start again feeling that that you are working as a team uh, and trusting each other and putting the best of you on top of the table uh, these challenges don't seem such a such a huge issue when you're working together and that's like sincerely something we we all felt so we are back i'm trying to look some of the questions that are popping up on the background so i just had a question from someone uh, liking to have a detailed like, example for academia, a step-by-step -step of a group one. I don't know if this question should go actually to Andres, but uh, I think it goes to more towards our team. Yeah. So we will try to answer these questions later. Bye-bye, Andres. It was good to see you. Thank and you. Keep in touch. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. It has been a really interesting webinar so far. Now we have a few minute break or you can grab a coffee or tea or stretch a bit. Even better, you can write your ideas on Padlet and interact with us. For example, you can write what you would like to hear more next time. Okay, so ju just before we go for the break, I'll try and answer the question that Virpi asked. I'll just see from the screen. So step by step of a group from day one until uh, final delivery in Pro Academia. So what I'd say, what I'd say is that in the beginning when we start in Pro Academia, everyone is kind of an individual. People that want to become business people or entrepreneurs, they go into Pro Academia. They start there. And they are kind of lonely wolves, they are individuals. But then the coaches kind of pressure us into starting to do projects together and setting up our company together. And when we're kind of forced in the beginning to start working together, we kind of accidentally start seeing that, okay, there is something good in teamwork. Maybe I need other people. And for me, like the kind of biggest learning was that often my opinions are, are not the best opinions and they are usually not the correct opinions. So for many people in Pro Academy, it's about kind of learning that there is a midway. You are not alone with your opinion. Your opinion is not kind of better than the opinion of other people. And this is what I'd say the first people are individuals. Then you're kind of forced into a team environment. And then you start seeing the fruits of teamwork. You start seeing that, okay, I'm getting more out of teamwork than what I'm giving. So why not continue doing this? And then I'd say that after the first maybe year, year and a half, the only way is up. And then at the end of the studies, I think that it's kind of a big issue that the time in Pro Academy is so short. Students are just setting up their businesses, you know, they're growing bigger and bigger. They have tested out different things. And usually in the final years, that's when students kind of realize that, okay, this is what I want to do. For example, in the beginning, a lot of people want to do social media marketing. And then people start doing it and they realize that, okay, no one is paying for this and there are so many companies doing this and I have to learn this and this and this. And then students decide that, okay, I want to do something else. Maybe it's sales, maybe it's, you know, setting up, I don't know, a clothes brand and that's okay yes i really agree i think learning is better when you're in a team and when you're doing it yes yeah looks like we have a little time for another question it has been popping up there for a long time already igor is asking about suggestions what the schools 
uh, could kind of do during the pandemic and what kind of um, hints or, or what kind of things we have done here in Finland. Uh, so actually, um, I think the most important thing uh, here is to remember that, that we will always have to think about our students, think about their learning. So this is where all the online learning and all the actions that we are doing should go towards. We have plenty of uh, free and uh, online tools, uh, activating tools. You know we like to talk about activating methods. So I think that's the most important thing. We have to keep our students motivated and also active in our schools. You will hear a little uh, later a video about the basic education school and see how they have actually solved these day-to-day -day issues in the schools during the pandemic. Thank you. And uh, now I think we go for a little break. Have a cup of coffee. Global challenges are not solved by accident. They are solved in classrooms, in laboratories, at researchers' desks. Solutions are found in places where ambitious and inspired people meet. Where they collaborate. Muista ylpeyden siitä, että seisoin omilla jaloillani ja vastasin itse elämästäni ja opinnoistani. Where children's curiosity awakens. Mä toivottaisin Tampereen yliopistolle ja korkeakouluyhteisölle pakettimatkojen sijaan löytöretkiä. Solutions are found in Tampere, in a multidisciplinary higher education community that offers more opportunities to learn, conduct research and find answers. In a community that upholds the highest academic standards for research and education, whilst determinedly seeking practical solutions. Yliopiston keskeisenä tehtävänä on luoda vahvoja polkuja yhteiskunnan uudistumiseen. Ammattikorkeakoulu tuo yhteistyön käytännön läheistä otetta. Solutions to global challenges are found in places where people believe in humanity and science. Bon dia, ni hao, hi, moi, whatever. Uh, I listened to some of these presentations just uh, 
20 minutes to half an hour, and I, I have a feeling that my brains are a little bit boiling just now. So much uh, nice things I have heard and so much wise uh, words. So I, I think we need some brain gym before we start the serious presentation from me, in fact. And uh, you know, we have to start with uh, shooting the rabbits. This is the rabbit. And this is my gun. Do the same with your hands. Rabbit and a gun. And when you shoot the rabbit, the rabbit became a gun. And the gun became the rabbit. And try to do it as many times as you can in 10 seconds. To gun and rabbit. And rabbit and gun, you know. And try it, and whenever you make a mistake, thank yourself. Because uh, in, in many cases, when we speak about the education and learning and teaching, the mistakes are like gifts. Uh, we have to be open for mistakes. In fact, I, I will concentrate a bit in my presentation in, in three points or four points maybe. First, something with to, do, to do with your competencies, that you, you really can do something if you like. My title is, Yes, I Can, and I have some stories about that. And something about the teachership, how it has changed in my age. I have started as a teacher in the 80s, 30 years ago, about. I have never graduated, in fact, but I, I get a diploma from university, so I graduated officially. But I still keep on going in my, in my identity building as a teacher. The third uh, point is maybe about why we need educational reform and why we have to keep on improving our education. Also in Finland, in Brazil, in China, all over the world. Uh, because the demands uh, of the future has changed. In fact, I was born in 1964. And 1964, I think it was the same year when Bob Dylan wrote a song called Times There Are Changing. In fact, it's, it was because of me, but, but it's, it's maybe because of times they were changing even them. Even them. And now I think they are changing even, even higher pace day after day. I used to live in a farm when I was a kid. And of course, you know that when you are living in the, in the countryside, you need your body to do things like helping my father in farming, doing something, digging holes in the, in, in the earth. Just now I'm doing our, the same thing in our garden because of my, my, my wife. But when I was a kid, I was working, uh, I would co-work with my daddy in the farm. And I have to use my whole body in learning the things, the competencies needed for farming. And when I went to school in the 70s, I don't have to use my body anymore. I don't have to use my, my creativity in a way. Because those days the schools were like, like an organization where we tried to kill, oh there, I said, they tried to kill your curiosity in a way, or, 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 or uh, creativity. Uh, I, I have a feeling now, when I, when I think my, my own history, that when I started as a schoolboy, it, it should be much, much easier to bring just head to school, not even a whole head, maybe just a part of my, my brains. Those part who are interested about mathematics and, and uh, literacy, maybe, but not so much creativity, art, literature, or creativity, to do something with your hands. We have the kind of hierarchy in our curriculum that the high things, the best things are these hard skills. And those soft skills are a bit like underdogs. Even nowadays, in many our, in our curriculums, we are not so interested about how we can achieve in the arts, in, the, in, in this kind of soft skills, for example. We are mostly concentrated to mathematics and, and things like that. Uh, it's, it's a, my teacher taught us to concentrate, to sit still, 
not use our body, not dance, not sing, not chat, not even group working like uh, uh, like the, uh, you heard before. Uh, it was in, in uh, Hannah's presentation, yes. Sure, uh, the group, group work came to school when I was schoolboy. And it was like amazing for us that we are working in the groups. But, but when I started as a schoolboy, it was alone, sit still, uh, not moving, mostly listening, repeating maybe. Even the language is repeating. And my teacher is uh, telling, the role of teacher is to, to spray and pray. I will tell you later about that. Some knowledge to the classroom. And we were like passive listeners. Maybe sometimes we were also uh, repeaters, that okay, even in the, in the paper pencil tests, because those days we only used these. And I was like a hitchhiker, like in this picture, hitchhiker who wants to step into this train of education. But I, I feel that I, I, I need to do something different. I, I, I really eager about, uh, about art and maybe even dance. I used to dance, even though, you know, I have to gain a little bit more, more uh, weight nowadays. But this is me, when I was younger, and my youngest son, Arttu. And you, you can see that we are both dreaming. This happened about 28 years ago. Uh, I was graduated as a teacher. I work as a teacher those days. And we both are dreaming. But what we are dreaming? Maybe we are dreaming about a better world, but our, our concept maybe was a little bit different. And now Artu is also adult, 30 years ago. And I'm still teaching. And I have to change my paradigm as a teacher a lot. From like knowledge pourer to facilitator, step by step. And, uh, when you think about these youngsters nowadays who are starting their school, uh, they will be in working life in the, 90, uh, in the 2070, something like that, about 50, 60 years from here. So it's maybe it will be changing the whole world again. The times there are changing. My formal teacher used to say to me that I'm, 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 I cannot hold the pencil rightly. It, it, this was what I, what I learned in my, uh, in my school, that I could not hold the pencil right. Now I can. I, I know I can. Or in fact I can, but I don't care. Because I'm using the pencil wrong way, but I use it for writing. Why we need to change in education, in my opinion? Because we have some problems in the world to solve. And only way to solve the problem is to use education. The poverty, pollution, plastic in oceans, war, even pandemia. We have to find the people who can solve the problems by not only using the brains, but using the human being as a holistic person in many ways. And we have to do our own duties as a teacher, as a, as a, as a uh, students, as a human beings to solve these problems. But we need well-functioning education because when the river is floating, the change is happening all the time. We cannot make the dam to the river. It's still floating. It finds another way. It's bifurcation, that you cannot cut the way of river, it will find a way. And also in the education, if we are stuck in the old procedure, or the old ways, we always have to trust that the education, the improvement of the human beings will find another way. And maybe it's our duty to do it right, that we will change the education as much as we can. If we just improve and put some more effort in this old-fashioned way, we can improve, for example, PISA results. But we want to see beyond PISA. What will we do differently? Maybe change something. 
to try something, make some mistakes, be open to conflicts, be open to mistakes, and be open to reflection. Teachers are the change agents. In my opinion, when I started as a teacher, this is a drawing, small drawing. Maybe you remember, some of you have seen this. When I started as a teacher, I started like paradigm like that. I don't want to see the reality of the world. I don't want to hear what the students want to tell me. Because I was the king of the classroom, you know. But I have my mouth open. And all the wisdom, you know, spit out of my mouth. And I have to say to my students that listen, because your master is speaking, your master voice, you know. And I have to change the paradigm step by step and find out how can I help my students to find their real potential. How to become best possible you and how to help them. And one question is that I have to concentrate to learner-centered education. And I changed my paradigm. And in this slide, you can see how it happened to me. I have to change my idea from op by opening my ears, by opening my eyes wide open, and shut my mouth but smiling. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a, it's my, it's, it is my identity building as a teacher. And I think we all need this kind of paradigm change. It's also in slide, by the way. And, you know, this, is made by, this slide is made by myself. This one, this, I'm, I'm so proud of that because I started my career as an art teacher. And I'm so proud of this painting I, made, I did my, by, by myself. And in the world, or in our brains, the world is not divided in subjects. It's more or less holistic mess. And if we need to change the education system, we need to work more and more multidisciplinary way. Not just, you know, academic skills, but how to ally the knowledge, how to build the bridges between the subjects, how to find the phenomena, how to find the passion of learning. I call the PBL, like passion-based learning or passion-based teaching. Spray and pray is not the way. If I'm a teacher and I have a can of wisdom in my hand, and I think I can spray it to my classroom, and after that, pray that at least some of the drops will hit somebody's head. It's not working anymore. We need this cooperation, collaboration. We need the team building. Curriculum is not just a book. This is not the curriculum. It's just the book. This is maybe the curriculum, because it's a question of actions. These students are working, and in fact, they are working in teams, even they seems that they are alone. But in fact, they are playing Pokemon Go. It's also part of learning. How to spread the learning environment all over, how to make the world as a school. And I have to say to you, I have a student who say that Everything I learned from school is that I don't know anything. I can't do anything. And my answer is, yes, you can. Thank you so much. Thank you, Juha. So as someone who has studied quite, quite recently, I completely understand that we need a change. You know, we need to change to the learner-centered paradigm. But uh, there's a lot of change resistance. When I'm exporting education, you know, I'm traveling to, for example, African countries. And for them, this new approach is so radical that the, there's a few pioneers that are, you know, accepting that we have to change. But then most of the teachers are traditional teachers and they resist, resist and resist. So how do you deal with this resistance? In, in fact, I, ha I have to say that don't resist the resistance. 
but just try to make them your, you, you know, your, 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 your co-workers that, that you can use this resistance as a tool, you know, like, like a judo. That if, if somebody forces you and you said, okay, what a brilliant idea, maybe we can use it somehow, but differently. It's, it's, a, it's a question about uh, use the force of your enemy to your own good. It's, it's a, we have always resistance, of course. And uh, don't, don't uh, let feel, people feel that they are not, uh, like, that they lose their dignity. That they have to be appreciated, even though they are old school members. Because, because uh, like, like we heard before, that the change is like baby steps uh, movement. And it takes some time, it takes some, uh, it takes some uh, courage to face res so resistance and also conflicts. Like I said, to be open for the conflict. Uh, but also you have to find this chase agent. I call them hypos, high potential persons among your teachers. Okay, thank you, Juha. So I just heard that we have uh, over 460 participants now. And Zoom is still working, so that's great. And next up, we are having an online speaker called Erika. Hello, everyone. Thanks to invite me to this important event. I will go to speak about a redesign, a curriculum redesign by competency of high technical education in the Dominican Republic. Okay, let me see. Okay, we have uh, in higher education three levels, higher technical level, undergraduate under level, postgraduate level. Uh, the higher technical level is the first level of higher education and is very close to production sector of the economy. This is, um, the, the, uh, the, the duration is usually two years. Uh, okay, uh, the primary and secondary education curriculum begun to be redesigned in Dominican Republic from 2011 until 2016. All educational programs had to be redesigned to a competency-based curriculum starting at 2015. At this moment, we have 192 uh, undergraduate programs related to education that has been uh, redesigned by competence. In 2017, uh, in the Dominican Republic uh, and the Union, the European Union and Hispanic Agency for International Development Cooperation signed an agreement called a uh, budget, uh, budgetary support program for the strengthening of higher technical education and vocational training in the Dominican Republic, known as PROI de P2. The aim is, is to strengthen the professional technical training and to implement the national qualification framework that is, uh, that is in development yet in our country. Uh, we have 97 programs distrib uh, distribute in, in 21 higher education institutions. Uh, and these are distributed too in 12 professional families. Uh, the main, the biggest families is uh, in informatics, in computers. Okay, so the main elements to modify are competency-based professional profile. Now the job maker or market guide the competence that a student need to develop in the programs know as graduation profile. Uh, other is learning outcomes based on the graduation profile, internship system, minimum 400 hours of internship, uh, admission that could be flexible, uh, taking into account the previous competence developed on the job, and transfer and validation system based on competences in competencies developed. Um, 
In 2019, with the project of Proete P2, a, a team of 13 people, aged from the different institutions of the Dominican Republic and the higher minister of education, visited Tamper University of Applied Science, TAM, to take the seminar on vocational technical training of, uh, uh, of the Finnish educational system. <laughs> uh, we visited different vocational colleges like TAC, ALMA, Tredu and Pro Academia was a really interesting experience. We learned uh, things like how is the Finnish educational system model works, uh, understand the collaboration system between institution and industry, and things like understand quality uh, assurance strategies too, and mechanisms for curricular review of technical education. Um, we have been applied what we learned uh, that we could adapt to all country. But there are some points that we need to improve yet. Uh, for example, we have uh, we need to improve the competency assessment, the validation of competencies, and, and the admission according to competencies. We hope uh, we could be the uh, a second time uh, that we could visit Finland again, uh, town, and learn this part with you. So thank you. Thank you, Erika. So unfortunately, we don't have a time for a question right now, but our next speaker is very familiar to you. So I'd like to introduce the man and machine, Jiri Vilpola. Wow, what an introduction, thanks. Okay, so welcome warmly on my behalf also to, to this great webinar. It's a pleasure to be here and say a few words about the e-learning and online pedagogy. My name is Jiri Vilpola and I'm working at TAMK, teacher education and uh, the most of my work concerns uh, digital pedagogy, and, uh, and that's the also a topic of my PhD research. So this is a huge topic for me, and I'm very enthusiastic uh, talking about it, and it's good to be here. And 15 minutes is a short time, but I try to keep it clear and, and simple. But when we are talking about online learning, and, and uh, e-learning pedagogy. Uh, I think this spring or this year has made a huge impact on the whole world to this topic because we all know the reasons that uh, in very short time we had to reconsider our online practices and in very short time, in only days or weeks, we had to uh, arrange our learning and teaching mostly in online almost everywhere in the world. So this has been a huge burst, the digital pedagogy. But now we have, have to also ask, is this a good thing to the digital pedagogy or is there something risks or, or something to reconsider? But I'll come back to that at the, at the end of my presentation. But this topic is, is hot now, and we all know the reasons why. But um, when we talk about online learning or e-learning, I would like to go back to just learning. Because I think we all have uh, experiences about uh, online learning or classroom learning that hasn't been so good or hasn't been so effective. And I think we also have experiences like one today we are having, that we have a great experiences learning and working together in online environments. So is good learning about environment or is it about the learning itself? So my favorite question to ask is when we are talking about online learning or, or e-pedagogy or whatever, go back to the basics ask yourself, what is good learning? 
And where does that st start? Where does good learning start? I think we all know and we all have the feeling that we need motivation and we need to belong to, to something, to some topic, to some group, to some profession or, or whatever. Sense of motivation, sense of belonging, those are very essential things when we are talking about starting a learning process. And also we know that in, in, in the constructional way of thinking, learning, it's very important also to address our prior learning and our experiences about these, these topics. So when the learning starts, these are the questions to ask. How we can engage our students to these things? How to, how to encourage this as a teacher? And as we go on with the learning process, we all have to know what we are learning and how we are going to do it. That's a very basic question also. So when you are figuring out your online course or, or e-pedagogy or, or whatever, you need to set your competence goals or learning goals very clear, very simple, very transparent, but also inspiring and motivating. And, and during the process, you need to get back to this every once in a while. Uh, are, we, are we going in the right direction? Are we accomplishing these goals? And so on. And after the goal setting, we need to, of course, address the new information and, and, and link that to somehow to prior competencies and understanding of our students. This is the part when we introduce the new topics and, and new things and, and, and started to link that to the, our prior understanding. And of course, online learning or e-pedagogy doesn't have to be sitting on your computer wearing your headphones and, and typing your keyboard. But uh, there is always, I think, learning needs participation, collaboration, doing, experimenting, implementing, and, and being active. And I think this is the very important part of the learning process as a whole. And, and this is what we are usually missing in, in some kind of a uh, bad or, or poorly planned online, online learning courses. You have to activate your students and you have to uh, particip uh, enhance participation and, and do things like that to keep them busy and keep them uh, like, uh, enthusiastic. And of course, at the end of any kind of a learning process, it's important to evaluate or assess the learning. Have we, have we uh, reached the goal goals? Have we reached the competence frameworks and so on? And now it's time also to reflect a little bit for the future. Uh, what are my learning goals to the future? What I want to learn in the future? What I need to learn in the future concerning to the uh, competence goals and my future dreams as a professional and so on. And I think this kind of a socio-constructive cycle is the thing that we need to tackle in, in every learning, in classroom, in face-to-face -face situations, and also in MOOCs, in online learning courses, in, in everything we do also in online. And besides being socio-constructive when it comes to learning, we also need to remember that our students need support and they need it usually a lot. And, and uh, I think there is three different keys that we need to remember concerning e-learning that what support we should offer to our students. Of course, support to the content of the learning. There is new, new stuff that they are learning. It might be uh, difficult. They have maybe uh, they don't have experience about it, so they need a support to the learning of the content, of course. But also in online situations, uh, students need to be more self-directive, and they have to take responsibility of their own learning, and that is hard for some people, and they need support to the learning process also. 
And third part, of course, is the technology. So if we are using different kind of an applications or platforms and so on, we need to make them easy and we make, have to make a good instructions and, and give some time to rehearse those things and so on and give support when needed. And also, when it, when it comes to research, the most dropouts of online courses, they are uh, somehow related to also these issues. Uh, lack of support, uh, poorly, poor communication on the online course and so on. So in this short time, I think this was the, the key elements what I like to say. But everybody also always wants to hear about the tools. What tools do I use? And I just want to say that there are tools. There are a huge amount of tools and there are a huge amount of free tools also. Uh, if you just Google uh, top 200 applications for learning or something like that, you get a list of the tools you can use. But uh, choose them wisely, choose them to serve students, choose them to serve the societal constructive cycle of learning and offer support to your students. And then you are, I think, on the right path. And for the end of my presentation, I was uh, telling that we'll come back to this COVID situation. And this situation that we have now, we had had a, had a huge uh, explosion of digital tools. But now we have to be critical. And now we have to re recognize kind of the emergency solutions. Because I think we, had, we, we were forced to be very fast with our decisions, what tools to use and so on. So now we must think again that are these tools worth using in the future? Or do we need to make some kind of a corrections to our uh, tool pack that we can uh, maintain a pedagogical and constructive aspect to learning? So, COVID situation was a good thing to uh, online learning, but it's also a risk that we don't want to have a hasty uh, solutions to online learning and we have to reconsider. So thank you for listening and uh, I hope you all the best and most of all, stay healthy. Thank you, Yiri, for your wise words in these times. Uh, I just heard we have more than 470 participants, so we are kind of in our limits of boundaries, so we are struggling there to keep up the, the Zoom. So my apologies if you are having any trouble, but we, we continue here. Uh, there are a couple of questions for you, Yiri. Um, I think most of you had a couple of questions from China on how to encourage students on online study. I think you've already answered this and also to how to create interaction and involvement. Uh, but I would like to challenge you with a very difficult question. Uh, it seems like in uh, Brazil, they have plenty of problems uh, with students who don't have online connection at all. So there is a question for you. So should they stop in public schools where children don't have access to online learning and work only with those who have access? Wow, <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, I think uh, education is, it's, should be always about the equality. But, but what is equality? That's a, that's a very uh, tough philosophical question. And I don't have the correct answer to that. I'm sorry about that. But uh, I think uh, even in Finland, in, in some part of, uh, or in some schools, we, we have the situation that uh, not all children have the same access to these uh, tablets or mobile phones or applications or computers. So I think the Finnish solution has been that uh, uh, we are trying to get some of those uh, devices to schools so that schools own them. And, and also the online connections are provided by the school. And children who can't work with them, those devices or connections at their homes, they can learn that in, in the school 
uh, with, with teachers and with the school connections and devices. So maybe that should, could be the, the first step to get the devices and connections to the school and get all the children to the school and learn, learn uh, the, these digital tools there. And, and um, may, may, maybe that could be some kind of a starting point. Uh, thank you, Jiri. Uh, now we are going back to our online guests and we have Esther Carvalho, Barb Carvalho joining us uh, from uh, Rio Branco School uh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Vivi. It's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to share ideas and deeply think with Global Tanks alumni at this complex moment of our lives. And uh, I will begin uh, talking about the scenario using the word VUCA, which is the acronymous of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. As educators, we have been thinking about curriculum redesign in order to prepare students to live in a VUCA world. But we were not prepared to live in a VUCA world like this in a pandemic scenario. As people, as citizens, as educators, we are living a pandemic of emotions. And uh, I am a, a principal, a head principal in Rio Branco School in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and we are maintained by Sao Paulo Rotarians Foundation. And, then, and as independent schools, we provide instruction for children from two to 18 years old. We have around 2,300 students and 300 teachers. And these situations we are facing brought us both challenges and opportunity. Uh, first of all, the regular school year as known by us doesn't exist in, in 2020 anymore. The learning environment has completely changed. So it's not about bringing to remote learning environment our face-to-face -face experience. Uh, it's not enough. And uh, it's not only about infra infrastructure or techno technology, it's about people. And these people must be kept balanced, engaged, safe and confident, prepared to face these challenges. Another very important thing that we have learned is that empathy and collaboration are crucial to succeed. And here part of, of our teacher groups, uh, this is our weekly uh, meeting and it has changed to this context. We have been working in big and small group splitting the teachers in different subject areas, for instance, and so forth and so on. And uh, what I would like to share with you is that we are thriving this moment, doing well, because we have been investing for a long time in professional development and in curriculum, curriculum redesign in order to foster innovation, creativity, collaboration, and engagement uh, among our teachers and in students in our schools. Since 2007, we have a close relationship with the Finnish educational system. And regarding our partnership with Thank, since 2014, we have implemented our cohort experience called 21st Century Education. After that, we have provided a program called Emerging Trends in Education, ETE, involving more than 70 educators in these two different programs. And in order to deal with this scenario in both resilient and creative ways, as a leader, I have asked to the teams to consider as a possibility that we will need to work on remote a way until the end of 2020. And you know, children must learn. So we have to break with what we know and instead of struggling over something that we can have, which is our on-site school, we have to project our own 
uh, our work to guarantee high quality learning in this new environment. For instance, focusing on literacy. And I'm really proud of my team. They are amazing. As, uh, as we have huge problems in terms of equity and quality in education in our country, I wish we had a Rio Branco school for each Brazilian students. Also, I'm very grateful to have this partnership with Thank that allow us to meet such inspired and competent people that are part of our history. And last but not least, I would pretty much like to thank to Carita, the one who made all that possible for her care, friendship, and inspiration during all this journey. Kitos, and thank you very much. Thank you, Esther, for your inspirational comments and sharing. Um, you are doing a very important job. Uh, there is a one question uh, that I would like to formulate to you. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think uh, you had some sort of an advantage in your school because you have been preparing your all those 70 teachers to these e-learning competencies uh, quite a long time uh, ago? Sure. Uh, I believe that our past experience, even uh, with our cohort programs or as a Google reference school uh, and dealing in our regular days with the challenge to be uh, innovative, uh, I think it, it did a difference. It really did a difference uh, in this online environment, for sure. Uh, we were prepared, more prepared than, than others. So thank you once again for joining us. Uh, at this moment, uh, we will show you the video I talked about uh, earlier. Uh, Multi Education ha pre has uh, prepared this video for you, and it takes us to see how this COVID situation is handled in a normal Finnish basic education schools. Hello, my name is Pia Tynkkynen. Me and four of my colleagues are Moti Education. I am a special education teacher. Hello, my name is Tuire Akula. I'm a language teacher and I'm also a part of the international team in our school. Hello, my name is Kati Vitikainen. I am a teacher of health education. Hello, my name is Minna Kartunen. I teach history and social studies. I'm also part of the international team of my school. Hello. My name is Saya Artama. I'm a teacher of mathematics, physics, chemistry, and STEM course. I also lead our school's welfare team. On March 18, 2020, Finland started a two-month period of distance learning. Our government's decisions were announced only two days before. Our goal was to continue teaching according to our national core curriculum. Only pupils with strong special needs and pupils at the age of 7 to 10 were allowed to go to school. It soon became clear that municipalities, schools and teachers had different kind of capabilities to face these new challenges. In my school, there was a really good situation. We had enough computers for every teacher and for every pupil who needed to learn one for their work. 
Uh, we also had several digital learning environments available and huge range of programs to select. And then we also had digital tutors who were helping us online throughout the whole period. During the distance learning period, it was really important for us teachers to keep contact with the pupils and we wanted to meet them online every day. Yes, and it was also important for us teachers that we had the autonomy to choose what kind of ideas, materials we would be using during the distance learning. Mm. And we also had a lot of help from the special education teachers and uh, school assistants who helped us teachers with the pupils who, who had difficulties during the distance learning period. And uh, for the most of the teachers also wanted the um, pupils to return the exercises after every class so that we could keep evaluating the process. Yeah, it was amazing how many things we were mm -hmm. able to do online, like we were able to do group work with the students, organizing different groups. Uh, students were giving presentations. Yes, and we teachers, we could um, have online exams and we could give them uh, the pupils individual guidance and feedback all the time and yeah so much more national inquiry that was answered by 50,000 pupils in Finland. Yeah, there were some really good news in that survey. Average pupil studied approximately three to five hours per day. They had done all the exercises and they got help from their parents and from the teacher. And 95% um, of the pupils received exercises and materials from their teachers. And also 90% of the students had online lessons via internet. There were some challenges as well. Some of the pupils, they started really strong the distance learning, but as the time went by, they got more passive and started to struggle with the studies. That is true. Some of the pupils really had difficulties with learning or worries with mental health or problems at home. Well, pupils with lower self-guidance, they were at risk at leaving behind at their studies. Mm. And according to the pupils, their most difficult subjects were mathematics and languages. Yes, and to be honest, most of the students, they really missed back to school <laughs> and they missed their friends and the social circles at schools. I know. And we missed back to school as well. Definitely. <laughs> According to our experiences, there are five key elements for a teacher to succeed online. Autonomy. Freedom gives teacher more opportunities to innovate. Cooperation. That improves all teachers' know-how effectively. 
creating digital material to guide and follow pupils' performance throughout the whole learning process. Various teaching methods to keep pupils' interest alive. Individual guiding to help pupils with different kind of challenges. Thank you for the lovely video. So a quick question that I have is that you were discussing about the challenges and experiences of the students and the teachers, but how have the parents seen this? What is the opinion of parents in this new way of learning? Well, I think that varied a lot. Some of the parents were really eager and they were helping a lot of their kids and uh, they were asking more questions. And um, then some of the parents, I think, who maybe had special kids at home, they were feeling uh, that there were too much work, that as teachers we were giving too many exercises or we were like going on too fast with our topics. So I think it was quite divided how the parents reacted. reacted. And may I continue? Of course. <laughs> um, uh, in our school, where we are teaching, most of the parents were happy about our job because we were asking about that. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was something like uh, over 80% of the answers were um, happy about the teaching and how it all went. So I would say that most of the parents were okay, were, were thinking that their, their um, kids got um, teaching and uh, we took care of them. Mm -hmm. And I'll say one thing more. Some parents who had a lot of work by themselves and didn't spend any time at home during the day. So for those, it was really, they really didn't know what the pupils were doing. So I think it was a bit of a surprise when the pupils came back to school if there was some exercises that uh, they didn't do or stuff like that so the parents were really busy by themselves as well so they didn't have any time to help the pupils yeah okay thank you very much and stella would you like to introduce her next guest yes thank you, thank you ladies thank you. it was thank very interesting to learn about this 
because Finnish basic education has been always a very popular topic among our, our alumni, especially the Chinese alumni. In fact, in Finnish basic education, there's another topic that is quite interesting, is the STEAM education. In Dunk, we have our own STEAM center where we trained multiple groups of teachers from all over the world in STEAM pedagogy. So our next speaker is joining us from China. Let's hear what he has learned from Dunk STEAM education. Hi, Global Alumni of Tampere University. I'm very glad to be invited to meet you here. My name is Leo Binli. I represent Orenberg Group. Last year, I participated in the Tank Education Program with the Guangzhou Education Bureau. Now, I would like to share some experience with you. Okay, so there are some technical okay. difficulties with the screen sharing, but now they should have it up and running, so let's have yes. another go. The classroom is everywhere in Finland. You can do it in, indoors or outdoors. And during the lectures, uh, we work together to make small motors and programming like a robot. And uh, we taste uh, this learning by doing concept. Uh, here is an example. Uh, look at these very simple tools. And can you imagine many principals are aged over maybe 55 years old and playing this like a child for like more than two hours. This experiment are actually not that easy to do. We all know this equation on the right side, and I bet many of you never did this experiment. I, I think everyone should try it. It's really very funny. We all very devoted and enjoyed. So this Finnish education greatly emphasizes the knowledge is learned when there is a need to learn, not massively filled. So learning is full of motivation and is difficult to forget. The most important teaching concept in Finland is to return the right to the student. student. Compared with the competition for exams, assessments, cooperation is the most significant feature of Finnish education. STEM teaching is uh, not a multi subjects, but a fusion of knowledge from more subjects. With a variety of teaching methods, such as the phenomenal teaching method, the group teaching method, uh, flipping classroom, uh, we develop students' transversal competencies. And one principal said China is not lacking advanced teaching theory, but to a suitable classroom teaching model based on learning. And however, how to convey Finnish education to the Chinese community so that more students and parents can understand the authentic Finnish education? This is the goal that requires us to cooperate. Uh, in 2020, Tampere University of Applied Science and Orenberg Group agreed to establish the Finnish STEM Education Center through our schools in China in order to allow more Chinese students to experience Finnish education. We also cooperate with many Finnish education companies, such as uh, Kid, Kid, Kid Science, uh, which offers the most playful science education for younger students. We hope in this way, more Chinese teachers can master the core concepts of Finnish education, respect the individual development of students, and use the flexible educational method to stimulate students' potential ability so that every student can learn and grow happily in a pleasant environment. Our Bear Center inspires every child's learning ability. We hope that our joint future can bring better education and opportunities for more and more families in China. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. It seems you learned a lot from Dunk. Here we have a question for you. Among all the things that you have listed, what 
excites you most in Finnish education? Yeah, uh, we, we think uh, we have uh, to return the rights of the study to the student to make the classroom is more suitable for the student instead for the examinations, uh, instead for these competitions. We also have to uh, do more cooperation with the cross-culture and the international cooperation. We are not only to educate the uh, students, we also educate more parents and also educate more teachers for the future. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. What a day we had. I think my learning curve has gone up. Uh, I have learned so much myself today. Uh, I will remember this for sure, for many, many years. Um, I want to thank you all for being uh, today with us. And I would also like to uh, keep you close to us as we will continue this format next fall. So hope to see you again there. Thank you. Also from my side, here we can see on Padlet we already have some topics, so there will be no issue setting up new events like this. So thank you also on my behalf. And if you need someone to set up a professional seminar, I'm more than happy to write a proposal for our students to come and arrange it for you. And our final speaker is our big boss and vice rector, Kirsi Viskari. Wow, what a webinar we've had today. First, I have to say that I'm extremely happy to have witnessed this event. Some team, including our staff members and students, have produced an interactive, engaging and professionally organized webinar with a very interesting group of presenters and presentations. Not to mention the feedback and the input our audience has given to it. Before summing up this webinar, I would like to share a few thoughts with you. This webinar has opened a whole new era of alumni work in many ways. It is the first ever event for TAM Global Education alumni starting a new tradition. And with such a large and active audience, I'm sure we all agree that this must become a tradition. In general, and now I generalize a lot, the alumni activities in Finnish universities are too often one way. Newsletters, lectures, seminars, all good things, but they take the alumni as passive participants. Also, web-based seminars are not often good examples of interactivity. But here today, we have experienced a very different event, and once again, I'm so happy to have been part of it. The combination of technologies, tools, channels, and activities, together with a good pedagogical plan, and of course, top with professional media production skills, have made the difference today. And then to summarize the content of the day, the presentations draw a very comprehensive picture of the educational and pedagogical philosophy which TAMC promotes. Garita discussed the new normal in education. And yes, indeed, we've had a dramatic spring, changing everything traditional in education. And of course, in all areas of living as well. The call for revolutionary thinkers to change the educational structures has now been made. So let's all be them. Learning, innovating and co-creating in open platforms requires curious people and wide thinking. Juha's presentation handled the different ways of learning and also placed the teacher as a facilitator instead of the all-knowing authority. This setup challenges the long traditions of higher education. It empowers and of course forces the learner to think and act and become an active part of the learning process. Uh, quoting Albert Einstein, we seem to have a joint idol with Karita. Uh, don't listen to the person who has the answers, listen to the person who has the questions. 
Uh, Tina's topic was about the hidden knowledge and the undiscovered talent of the students. Students can offer a fresh viewpoint to various kinds of challenges within industries, the business sector and the society. Also, problem-solving skills are among the most wanted meta skills by recruiters and they are needed in today's fast-changing and developing world. Yeri talked about e-learning, which is far from just tools and technology, but it requires a new pedagogical approach. This spring has been a test bench for a fast change to a totally virtual learning environment, and the skills of the teachers are also challenged. Still, it has shown how black swans can also be good motivators for change. And last but not least, Hanna discussed the role and importance of trust. In Tam's pedagogical alphabet, T for trust becomes first. Trust the process. This helps us all when trying and failing and trying again. Also, trust is the basic ingredient in a well-functioning team. Trust building within the team, group and network begins with a common goal. You also need to give time for trust creation. The most impressive part of the webinar has been the guest lectures provided by our, our alumni. They demonstrated the learning and impact our global education aims at reaching. And they also formed very good counterparts, commentary speeches and continuation for the Trump, Trump presenters' topics. They are also the best possible feedback we can wish for, sincere and directly from and by our own alumni. And the input of the audience is also a very valuable part of interactivity and co-creation. Your comments, ideas, uh, the applications, all feedback that you have given, they form a good source for further development together. Before ending my part, I would like to share a short Finnish poem with you. This translation is all mine, so forgive me, poet Helena Anhava, for this and all the mistakes. And it goes like this. Never let yourself become too old, nor being in a certain position. In order to be free on a spring day like this, to sit on the doorsteps of a grocery store and eat cone ice cream. Let's all keep curiosity, passion for learning and positive spirits in our minds. And finally, my most sincere thanks to the speakers, the audience, as well as the organizers. I hope to share another event like this with you again. Kitos. Thank you. Gracias. Obrigado. Take care. Be safe. Stay healthy. Bye.